At the end of the 1800s, many towns were run by a political machine. This group was in charge of the political party in a place and was led by a boss. It gave companies and voters services in exchange for money or political support. The boss was in charge of running the city and hiring people to work in the police, fire and sanitation departments. The boss ran the offices that gave businesses licenses and paid for building projects. Bosses were liked and respected because they were in charge and could solve problems. Many bosses were also new to the country. They spoke the newcomers' languages and helped them find jobs and places to live. In exchange, immigrants promised to vote. Political machines played a crucial role in providing essential services to cities. But unfortunately, some bosses within these machines succumbed to corruption, particularly through a practice known as graft. Graft involved the illegal use of political influence for personal gain, allowing these bosses to amass great wealth. In order to secure their power, party members resorted to fraudulent tactics, such as using fake names to cast enough votes in elections. Another unlawful practice was the kickback, where workers involved in city construction projects would overcharge for their services and then kick back a portion of the fee to the bosses. In return, these bosses would accept bribes from businesses, permitting illegal or unsafe activities to take place. One notable figure in this web of corruption was William M. Tweed, commonly known as Boss Tweed. He rose to power as the leader of Tammany Hall, New York City's most influential democratic political machine, and controlled a group of corrupt politicians called the Tweed Ring. To expose and ridicule Boss Tweed's corrupt activities, Thomas Nast, a political cartoonist, depicted him in newspapers. Over time, public outrage grew against Tweed's dishonest practices. In 1871, authorities took action and dismantled the Tweed Ring, leading to Tweed's imprisonment as a consequence of his crimes. For many years, presidents had been concerned about the issue of patronage, which involved granting government jobs to individuals from the same political party who had helped a candidate win an election. This practice often led to the hiring of unqualified and corrupt workers. In an effort to bring about reform, advocates aim to end patronage and establish a merit-based system. They believed that jobs in civil service, which involved government administration, should be awarded based on the qualifications of individuals, regardless of their political affiliations. President Rutherford B. Hayes took steps towards civil service reform during his term. He appointed independent individuals to his cabinet and created a commission to investigate custom houses, which were centres of patronage. Hayes even dismissed two top officials from the New York Custom House. However, when some members of the Republican Party opposed these actions, Hayes chose not to seek re-election in 1880. The issue of patronage hiring caused a significant divide within the Republican Party. The stalwarts, who were against changes in the patronage system, clashed with the reformers who supported reforming the system. Eventually, the party settled on an independent candidate, James A. Garfield, who won the presidential election but had ties to the reformers. Tragically, shortly after his election, Garfield was assassinated by a member of the stalwarts. Chester A. Arthur, who succeeded Garfield as vice president, surprised many by embracing reform once he became president. Despite his stalwart background, Arthur pushed for the passage of the Pendleton Civil Service Act in 1883. This act established a bipartisan civil service commission responsible for awarding government jobs based on merit rather than political connections. It marked a significant step in reforming the civil service system. Meanwhile, in state governments, some governors also pursued reforms. Theodore Roosevelt, New York's governor at the time, refused to fill civil service positions through patronage. He defied the wishes of the state Republican machine regarding policy, which upset the Republican Party. In an attempt to remove him from his position, the machine leaders nominated Roosevelt to replace the vice president who had passed away. Roosevelt accepted the nomination, and the control of New York's politics reverted back to the machine's influence. The passage of the Pendleton Civil Service Act brought both positive and negative outcomes. 
On the positive side, more qualified individuals began filling government positions, ensuring a more competent workforce. However, since politicians no longer had jobs to offer as a result of the merit-based system, they faced difficulties in obtaining financial support from their supporters. Consequently, some politicians turned to wealthy leaders for financial backing, strengthening the ties between the government and business interests. During the late 1800s, political reformers also grappled with the issue of tariffs. A tariff is a tax imposed on goods entering or leaving a country. Big business favoured maintaining or increasing tariffs as they protected American industries from foreign competition. On the other hand, the Democratic Party opposed high tariffs because they often led to higher prices for consumers. Tariffs became a central topic in presidential elections for several years. In the 1884 presidential election, Grover Cleveland, a Democrat, emerged as the victor. Despite his efforts, Cleveland struggled to reduce tariffs as he lacked the support of Congress. In the subsequent election of 1890, Cleveland faced Republican candidate Benjamin Harrison, who enjoyed support from big business. Although Cleveland won more popular votes, Harrison secured a majority of electoral votes. Harrison signed the McKinley Tariff Act into law, significantly raising tariffs to their highest levels ever. However, in the following election of 1892, Cleveland defeated Harrison and became the only president to serve two non-consecutive terms. Cleveland aimed to lower tariffs, but he refused to sign a bill that included a federal income tax provision. Nonetheless, Congress passed the Wilson-Gorman tariff without Cleveland's signature, resulting in lowered tariffs. In 1897, William McKinley assumed the presidency and once again raised tariffs.